Take a look at where you are in your life. Your relationships, your home, your career, all the things that make your life what it is. Did you always expect to be here? Was this all meticulously planned from your childhood so you'd become exactly the person you always wanted to be? Chances are, you didn't. A different location, a different job, a different relationship. Life has a way of taking you places that you never would have dreamed to go. And some of us, honestly, would have preferred if things were different. But how much do you get from planning out every detail of your life? Sure, there's the satisfaction of reaching a goal, but often the most memorable, the most impactful moments are the ones that were unexpected. The moments that you didn't plan for, when you had to adapt and change almost immediately. Those moments are rarely fun at the time. But when you look again, you realize how much they shaped you and how much better your life is because of them. A lot in life seems predetermined. As if despite all your plans, you're somehow stuck on a single track with no way to change your fate. But if you look a little closer, you can find that the course you're on may have a little more going on than you expect. And the more you look, the more you can learn to enjoy those unexpected moments and perhaps learn what life is like when things don't quite go according to plan. As Nintendo looked to make the next installment of the Zelda series on the DS, the producers looked to Phantom Hourglass as their starting point specifically the Temple of the Ocean King and the Phantoms inside, expanding and experimenting with their purpose and design. But there was a desire to mix things up as well, and in particular, an urging to move away from the same ocean and ships that had dominated this branch of the series, while still trying to hold on to that same sense of discovery and inspired by a children's book the latest installment moved from the waves and instead came to the railways in their new game subtitled Spirit Tracks. One of the hardest things about a series in any respect is when demand pushes for more titles and more content than originally intended. Creators are constantly walking a fine line between creating something new while still having everything somehow stay true to the spirit of the series. Go too far in either direction, and you end up with very unhappy fans. Zelda walks this line constantly. With 35 years and nearing 20 games in its main series alone, it's a constant struggle to create something new, while also making it the same. With many fans arguing that they've fallen off that line, at least a few times. The idea of a fantasy adventure with trains of all things could definitely be called something new, and is certainly one of the more unusual directions for a Zelda game to take. Even though early designs for the original Zelda had played with the concept of a future modern world to adventure in, the series had to this point stayed solidly in what is generally considered medieval times. A jump to the industrial age was certainly a new one, and what added to the confusion was the opening sequence, where your train ride is accompanied by a cheerful, ghostly figure who looks awfully familiar. The reasoning for the trains, at least, is given an immediate explanation as you start your game. In a backstory presentation similar to Phantom Hourglass, you're told the story of a conflict between the spirits of good and a great evil. Although the evil could not be destroyed, it was defeated and sealed with familiar-looking chains that crisscross the land. The methodology for the backstory is similar for a reason. Nico, now an exceptionally old man, 
is still offering story time to anyone who will listen, even if it's a sleepy engineer apprentice. Link's mentor, Alfonso, comes to wake him in order to take him to Hyrule Castle, where Link is to be recognized as the newest royal engineer. If the familiar character designs wasn't already enough of an indication, the control scheme quickly shows that the development team borrowed heavily from the Phantom Hourglass setup. Despite no longer having a fairy to indicate your direction, all interaction, movement, and combat is still done with the touchscreen, with only a few minor alterations. Most major differences and emphases would come later, as your exploration of this new Hyrule truly begins. At first sight, it seems as if Spirit Tracks has the most restrictive overworld in the entire series. While your destinations aren't necessarily predetermined, your routes are undeniably set in stone. The nature of driving a train means that you're restricted to whatever set of rails you're currently on. That gets concerning when you're sharing the same set of tracks with other engines, particularly when dark forces possess those engines and start gunning for you. All you can do is control the speed at which you travel and switch directions as the opportunity presents itself. And yet, despite that restrictive travel, Spirit Tracks is somehow able to have perhaps the most interactive overworld in the franchise. Ensuring safe passage across the land requires careful planning of your route. And once you're on your way, constant vigilance is needed to make sure you avoid any collisions. When you aren't avoiding other trains, enemies in the field necessitate continual awareness, either to scare animals off with the whistle or strike foes with the cannon. Additional objects in the environment require your attention as you catch rabbits for a very enthusiastic collector, warp across the land, or notice unique landmarks and other items of interest. All these different aspects come together later on as you play the role of a true engineer, transporting people and supplies across the countryside. Items like fish and ice, susceptible to environmental conditions, have to be quickly shipped to their destination. Various passengers, intent on a comfortable journey, pay close attention to whether you're following all the posted signs along the tracks. And all of them are subject to damage and loss, should the hazards on the rails do you damage. Your first passenger, interestingly enough, is Princess Zelda herself. The event surrounding your certification ceremony is filled with suspicion, with rumors of the tracks fading from existence. First on the list of suspects is Chancellor Cole, who pretty much has conniving villain written all over him. Taking advantage of your engine, Zelda requests your assistance in investigating the nearby Tower of Spirits. After changing into your familiar-looking disguise and helping Zelda sneak out of the castle, the two of you and Alfonso make your way to the tower. But you don't get very far before the tracks vanish, taking your train out of commission. And the Tower of Spirits is suddenly broken into pieces. As a demonic train flies overhead, those responsible don't take much time to reveal their intentions. Cole and an intimidating servant named Bjorn appear to take Zelda captive. Alfonso's efforts to fight Bjorn off are met with defeat, and your attempts at defense prove useless. Then, what happens to Zelda is unthinkable. When you awaken, you're back at the castle. And Zelda is not fully herself. Her ghostly form is somehow invisible to all but you. Having no one else to turn to, she asks for your help in continuing the investigation. After obtaining a sword and making your way through the back of the castle, the two of you together 
finally reach the Tower of Spirits. Inside, you find an unused train engine and another individual, also on wheels. Anjean, the guardian of the tower, is there to greet you with a warm smile and a dire warning. Cole's efforts to revive the demon Maladus requires the divine power residing in Zelda. But only the physical part of her. Zelda's response is unsurprising. With no other option but to climb the tower yourself, and with no other help but Zelda's spirit, you head up the stairs into the mazes that await. The tower is an immense improvement on the Temple of the Ocean King, as you no longer have to retread floors unless you feel like treasure hunting. Instead, you simply move up the central pillar to each section. The height of the tower, once put back together, very apparent with each level you climb. What is easily the most unique aspect of this game occurs within the tower floors themselves. When Zelda had a body, you had the chance to direct her to different locations and act as she moved. It was a mechanic touched on briefly in Phantom Hourglass, but here, a moment of danger and panic gives Zelda the chance to do something she has never truly had a chance to do be an active part of the adventure. While Zelda has almost always been a contributing factor, her role has been minimal, to say the least. Now, with a physical form that can withstand any onslaught, Zelda can now help you in the most direct way possible. The multiple kinds of phantoms in the tower means Zelda can assist in combat, traverse areas you cannot, and even escort you for a change, helping you reach difficult locations. She does have her flaws, and the switching between Zelda and Link can be jarring, especially if you're dealing with a difficult opponent or a short time frame. But with careful planning and timing, there is nothing the two of you can't handle. Your rewards for climbing the tower are rail maps, granting you access to significant sections of tracks and the major population centers in each region. Once again, the Anoki, Gorons, and regular people that we saw in Phantom Hourglass return. While their designs and themes fit the environments you find them in, apart from a couple individuals, there isn't anything too distinctive about them. Thankfully, your travels require enough visits to each location to make them feel more essential to the world that you're living in. The truly unique characters live on their own. In each region, another of Anjin's clan, the Lokomos, guard the rails that lead to the individual temples. To activate those rails, not only must their sacred instruments be played, but they must be accompanied by Zelda's spirit flute. Here we make a return to mystic instruments opening the way to our destinations, something we haven't seen since Oracle of Ages. The twist here is that the microphone built into the DS allows us to quite literally play the instrument. The duets played with the locomos have to be done with near exact timing in accordance to the provided rhythm, which can be quite a handful if you don't have an ear for music, or if your mic just doesn't seem to be working right. The dungeons continue the themes Phantom Hourglass left behind, with fully mapped out floors, and puzzles that tend to take up the entire floor instead of just individual rooms. You tend to get items early in these dungeons, making the entire dungeon, and not just the boss, focused on the new item. It gives you ample opportunity to master its use, making subsequent areas that much easier to handle when those items are needed again. Every completed dungeon activates more tracks and more opportunities to explore, introducing you to new characters and new problems that you can solve. 
as you transport those people and supplies across the countryside, the people's gratitude manifests itself in the form of force gems. In four swords, they acted as a power source for your blade. Here, they generate even more tracks for you to traverse, unlocking shortcuts to destinations, and sometimes granting you access to hidden locations with their own unique challenges. The treasures you get from these hidden areas, along with minigames and random chests, allow you to either earn additional money or trade them in for new parts for your train. All of it thanks to a familiar face, as Linebeck's grandson has set up a small business focused exclusively on treasure. With this setup, you're no longer forced to settle for whatever random parts you get. Instead, you have to handle a somewhat stacked randomizer, which makes getting a complete set a bit of a trial. But with enough persistence, you may end up with something truly gorgeous. Despite all that traveling, like with Phantom Hourglass, the world of Spirit Tracks is very compact. Four major sections with the Tower of Spirits residing in the center, all of it combining to form about six dungeons. The general progression is also very formulaic, making for a quaint, if somewhat predictable story. The major plot points nearly all take place inside the Tower of Spirits. We learn about Bjorn's desires, and his previous role as Anjean's apprentice. We see Anjean's sacrifice, as she places all her hopes and expectations on you and Zelda. But it's Zelda in particular that deserves our focus. Throughout the entire series, Princess Zelda has been a goal, a driving force, a pillar in the lore and structure for nearly every game. There are plenty of reasons, both canonical and practical, to explain why the games are titled The Legend of Zelda instead of The Legend of Link. But until this point, her direct influence on us as the player has been pretty minimal. Heartfelt moments, maybe an aid in battle while she wields the light arrows. Most of the time she provides some exposition and that's it. We never really get to know her. That is, until now. Having Zelda as a companion means that we get to see her constantly, see her react to events, and get to know her better than any other incarnation. We see how she struggles to fulfill her role as Hyrule's ruler, how her obvious youth and sheltered life has affected her confidence, and to some degree her ability to interact with others. We see she's afraid of rats, even as an invincible phantom. The more we see of her, the deeper our bond with her grows, and the more we see how her self-esteem is growing as well. She's still definitely a child, but that growth, something we see in almost all our companions, is what draws us to her and strengthens our connection to her and all of her incarnations. This incarnation, however, is still in peril. And when you finally reach the top of the tower, you find that Cole has successfully bonded the demon Maladus to Zelda's body. Extracting it, is no simple task. And after locating the necessary tools to both find Maladus and force him out of Zelda's body, you're met with a final challenge to bring him down. The Zelda series tends to make the final boss of each game a test of the primary mechanics that game is focused on. Ocarina of Time focused on the differences in combat with and without Z targeting. Phantom Hourglass require the use of your ship and the unique aspects of dual screens. Spirit Tracks spends the first section of its final run sending you through a maze of rails, requiring careful timing and quick thinking to not just avoid trains, but to locate the tiers of light that will allow you to eliminate them. That planning is then taken to the offensive, 
as you man both cannon and rails to slow and finally stop the demon train, allowing you to board. The final push and the final confrontation focuses on the teamwork you and Zelda have developed over the course of the game. With Zelda's phantom shell blocking Maladus' attack and you deflecting coals, the two of you push forward until Zelda is finally able to grab hold of her possessed body, giving you the chance to pierce it with the Bow of Light. Cast from the dark world you had entered, Zelda's body floats there, uninhabited, but for some reason, unable to accept Zelda's spirit. Then, in a moment of faith and clarity, Zelda calls out to the divine energy that is her birthright, and finally brings herself back to the realm of the living. But your task is not yet done, as Maladus' spirit is still present and very potent. With no empty body to possess, Maladus takes coals, vowing to use what little time he has to cover the land in darkness and destruction. Her courage and confidence awakened, Zelda is no longer content to let you face this alone. And after defending her long enough to bring her power to its peak, the two of you together unlock the energy needed to expose Maladus' weak spot. Link's role then turns to almost just being a distraction, while Zelda is the one doing the damage, launching arrows at Maladus' back. As the battle takes its toll, and Link struggles to break the crystal in Maladus' head, it's Zelda who rushes forward, and the two of you push with all your might, shattering the crystal and eliminating the demon once and for all. The two of you stand there, exhausted, triumphant, but saddened at the cost of victory. As part of his efforts to prove himself and to correct the mistakes he had made, Bjorn had sacrificed himself to allow Zelda the time to return to her body. But Bjorn, Angine, and all the other Locomos had been hiding a secret as envoys of the spirits. And Bjorn's sacrifice, though not completely without cost, was not his end. That happens a lot in these games. Characters thought defeated or dead are brought back in dramatic or unexpected ways. Death is often treated as not the end, or perhaps it's circumvented altogether. While it can get a bit cliche at times, there's something beautiful in knowing that death is not necessarily the end, and that just because things are bad now, it doesn't mean that it will always be that way. Before the final battle commences, before you and Zelda charge off with no way of knowing how things will turn out, Zelda asks you an interesting question. What will you do once the battle is over? The result is a change in the ending scene, as Zelda sees, to some degree, the consequences of that decision. In-game, it's just a fun little choice to make. But it's interesting to see how Link, who in this game spent his whole life training to be an engineer, is suddenly given a choice. As much as the world thinks, or even we may think, that life is going to turn out one way, it doesn't mean that that is how it will be. Your experiences your choices in the unexpected moments of life will make more of that life than expectation ever could. And even if you stay with what you originally thought you would be, 
that courage to do and experience something new will give you newfound appreciation for what you have and make it a little easier to try something new again. As Locomos take their leave, Zelda and Link stand there, hand in hand, with the knowledge that it is up to them to move forward. No longer guided by the knowledge of the spirits or the memories of the past, but with the courage and wisdom they have obtained, and the confidence that they can achieve the impossible together. Some routes may be predetermined, and some destinations can't be avoided. But seeing where those routes and destinations take us is part of the joy of living, and the adventure that can be found if you're willing to look outside and see just where your choices are taking you as you roll along the spirit tracks. Hey everyone, Contares here. Thank you so much for coming aboard with me in Spirit Tracks. I love being able to share my passion for this series, and I'm so grateful that you have decided to join me as we go along on this adventure. I'm so grateful for all of your support. Even though we covered a lot, there is still so much more that can be said about this game. So if you have a favorite moment or favorite boss, please leave a comment and let me know how you enjoy this game. If you want to see my journey in its entirety, you can check out my playthrough of Spirit Tracks in the playlist below. If you want to see my tributes for the other Zelda games, that playlist is down there as well. And if you want to see what I'm doing live, you can check out my Twitch channel, which is down there as well. I tend to be on there Mondays and Wednesdays in the evening time, exploring the many worlds and the many stories that can be found through gaming, with frequent trips to Hyrule as well. So come on by if you want to be part of the adventure. Otherwise, join me next time as we take to the skies, see the very beginning, and learn what it truly takes to become a hero in The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. Hope to see you there.